drink or not to drink? That is the big question. Young America wants to know, is drinking really a necessary part of our lives? Surely one doesn't have to drink to be popular, to be one of the group. There's never been any liquor in our home. But I sometimes wonder, how many people are there who do not use alcoholic beverages? My buddies and I feel that the fight to stay away from liquor is almost as difficult as the fight I've just been in. Everywhere you turn, you're bombarded with liquor ads on TV, the radio, and most often in magazines. The beverages are presented so attractively, the settings are so elegant, and the women are so glamorous, and everyone seems to be having such a good time that it's hard not to believe what you read and see. But how it seems to be and what really is are two very different things. The use of alcohol has probably caused more misery than any other product available to the youth of the world to say nothing of the adult population. Yes. Youth wants to know all there is to know about alcohol. Then we can answer the question for ourselves, to drink or not to drink. Now, really, can a few beers actually hurt anybody? We have heard some of the many questions about drinking that are bothering a great many of us today. A great proportion of the population, of our people, both young and adult, are concerned about drinking about alcohol. What is it? How does it act in our bodies? Why does it cause the drinker so much trouble? Uh, Dr. Hayes, my associate and I, have prepared visual material to help answer these questions and others. After a few demonstrations, we'll hear from our guest, Dr. Andrew Ivey, who knows as much about the alcohol problem in this country as anyone. First, we ought to answer some of these questions. All right. The drinking, consuming of alcoholic beverages is a vast problem all over the world. Well, let's begin with a few of the facts. Here you see a bottle of beer, one of whiskey, and another of wine. Now these are called alcoholic beverages because they contain alcohol, C2H5OH, the liquid in this beaker. Now, the more you drink, the more you partake of any of these beverages, the more alcohol you take into your body and the more pronounced the effect will be. Here, smell it. Phew, so that's what pure alcohol smells like, the stuff people drink. Why, it actually burns my nose. It burns in more ways than one. Now watch, I'll set this match to it. See, it burns quite readily. In fact, alcohol is used in racing cars, in rocket ships, and in torpedoes. I know about cars and rockets, but it's hard to believe people can drink alcohol and not burn their insides. Ah, but you can burn your insides, as you've aptly put it. Dr. Hayes? Let me show you what happens when you take an alcoholic drink. I'd like you to watch this animated film very carefully. Here we see Bill Smith taking an alcoholic drink. The alcohol travels down the esophagus to the stomach and the small intestines. It is absorbed directly without digestion through the walls of the stomach. Capillaries in the stomach absorb the alcohol and carry it to the portal vein, which carries the alcohol to the liver. Some of the alcohol is passed into the small intestine, and here capillaries absorb the alcohol, and via the portal vein, it is carried to the liver. Do you follow me? Those capillaries in that portal vein look like canals, or roads, sort of like a transportation system. That's exactly it. Our blood circulation is the transportation system of our bodies. The average adult has six quarts of blood, and this blood is pumped by the heart at the rate of 5 to 12 gallons a minute when a person is working. And remember this, the time required for a single drop of blood to travel from the heart to the head or to the feet and back again to the heart is about 20 seconds. Now, since alcohol is absorbed rapidly, it is present in the bloodstream within a minute or two after swallowing. 
In the liver, the alcohol is burned or oxidized. But not all the alcohol is burned at once. So that portion not acted upon immediately by the liver passes through the veins to the heart. The greater amount of alcohol that reaches the liver at one time, the greater amount of alcohol that reaches the heart. So, if Bill Smith takes several drinks in a short time, a good percentage of the ethyl alcohol in the drinks will be transported in the bloodstream and so to the heart. This alcohol is pumped by the heart to all parts of the body through the arteries. The liver is the one organ in the body where the oxidation of alcohol takes place. Small amounts of alcohol escape through the lungs and kidneys, but the greater portion still in the bloodstream remains unchanged until acted upon by the liver. Then that part of the alcohol that isn't burned up, oxidized, just keeps traveling around the body and back to the liver until it is burned up. Correct. The more you drink, the more alcohol there is in the bloodstream. The average adult can burn about one-third of an ounce of alcohol per hour, and that's less than a tablespoon. So, the more Bill Smith drinks, the more alcohol will pass through his body. This is very important. As long as there is alcohol in the bloodstream, some of it will reach the brain. And that's what makes people act oddly, stagger, and talk fuzzy. Yes. In the brain, the alcohol acts as an anesthetic. The judgment can be dulled, and a false feeling of relaxation occurs when there's less than one ounce of alcohol in the entire bloodstream. So, as Bill Smith continues to drink, the concentration of alcohol in his brain increases. And those portions of the brain which control the vocal cords, vision, and muscular reaction are affected. Bill doesn't heed these danger signs. And as he continues to drink, he becomes so befuddled he doesn't seem to care what happens. When the concentration of alcohol in his bloodstream reaches four-tenths of one percent, he loses consciousness. You'd think that Mr. Smith would know what would happen if he drank too much. He probably thought that when he took that first drink, it would be the only one. But alcohol, as I've pointed out, causes one to throw caution to the winds. And remember, even when Bill regains consciousness and manages to stumble home, it will be eight hours or more before he's partially sober. And he'll undoubtedly have a hangover when he awakens in the morning. That is, he'll have a pounding headache, a desire for great quantities of water, a bad taste in his mouth, be nauseous, and will want to be left alone until his nerves quiet down. So the wife and children will suffer, since his temper will be short. He'll also be burdened with a deep sense of guilt. And when he gets to the office, the boss loses as well, since Bill is incapable of working effectively. Remember also that alcohol is expensive, and the amount of dollars Bill spent on his spree might well be a large portion of his weekly paycheck. And I suppose that a lot of people spend much more than Bill did to buy something that just makes them feel badly in the long run. Yes, the cost of drinking is high, in more ways than one. There are about 78 million occasional drinkers in the United States today, and about 19 and a half million regular drinkers. That is, 25% of the 78 million adult drinkers of alcoholic beverages are dependent on alcohol and need treatment. Listen to Dr. Andrew C. Ivey, who for many years was president of the professional schools at the University of Illinois. According to the New York Medical Society, there are nine million alcoholics in our country who have greatly harmed themselves economically, socially, spiritually, and bodily by drinking alcoholic beverages. This is 11% of all adult drinkers. With so many millions who do drink, there can't be many who don't. Oh, but there are. Over the age of 15 years, there are at least 38 million total abstainers, or persons who don't drink. And their number is growing as the facts about alcohol become more widely known. You can drink when you're an adult if you want to, but before you decide, think carefully if it's worth the great price you may have to pay. Here's another piece of startling information. The National Safety Council has published the appalling fact 
that from Pearl Harbor to VJ Day, there were three-fourths as many persons killed and injured by traffic accidents due to drinking alcoholic beverages as were killed, wounded, and missing in our armed forces. Back in 1949, there were approximately twice as many people killed and injured by traffic accidents due to drinking as were killed and wounded annually on the average in World War II. It just doesn't make sense. Perhaps it's a silly question, but is it just as dangerous to drink beer or wine as it is whiskey? Isn't whiskey a whole lot stronger, and if so, more dangerous? Drink for drink, they each contain about the same amount of alcohol. I'll show you what I mean. The active agent alcohol in beer, whiskey, wine, and related beverages is identical. The common name for this beverage alcohol is grain alcohol. Uh, the chemist calls it ethyl alcohol. Now let's observe three different average sized alcoholic drinks. This is a glass containing 12 ounces or one bottle of four and a half percent beer. Now the test tube holds the amount of ethyl alcohol contained in the single glass of beer. It is 0.54 ounces. Next we have a three ounce glass of port wine which is 20 percent alcohol by volume. This test tube contains the amount of ethyl alcohol found in this three ounce glass of wine. It is 0.60 ounces. Now we have a whiskey highball, an eight ounce glass containing a mixture of soda water and one ounce of bonded whiskey, which means it is 100 proof whiskey. In this one ounce of whiskey, there is one half ounce of ethyl alcohol. Now let's look at the three test tubes containing the amount of ethyl alcohol in each drink. We quickly see that the amounts are almost the same, except there's a little more alcohol in the glass of beer and the glass of wine than in the highball made with one ounce of bonded whiskey. Now, in answer to some of your individual questions before our demonstrations, the average expense of each family using alcoholic beverages amounts to a bit more than $600 per year. Some families spend a good deal more than others. People who frequent expensive bars can easily spend a thousand dollars or more a year. And don't forget this. It's been estimated that alcoholism costs the nation's industry more than two billion dollars a year, primarily due to absenteeism and careless workmanship. More than two billion dollars? Why, that's more than two thousand million dollars, isn't it? Yes, more than two thousand million dollars a year. Here's another startling figure. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, says that the annual cost of all crime in the United States is over $15 billion. And the smallest estimate of the cost of crime attributed to drinking is $2,764,000,000. Well, now, we'd like to call back Dr. Ivey to sum up our discussion in this forum on alcohol. Dr. Ivey. Every young person should know one, that at present no human being can be regarded as immune to dependency on an addiction to alcohol. We cannot predetermine who is susceptible and who is resistant to becoming an alcoholic. Alcoholic addicts come from the educated and the ignorant, the rich and the poor, the clergy and church members, as well as from among criminals. Two, young people should know that one out of nine social drinkers reaches the stage where he is repeatedly in trouble because of alcohol. That is one of the grave risks the social drinker takes. Furthermore, one out of four social drinkers becomes dependent on the drug alcohol. That is, they do not feel normal without alcohol in their blood. Three, Young people should know that the really dangerous driver is the one who has had only two or three drinks and still thinks he is in the possession of his faculties, but whose driving judgment and skill have been impaired. Remember, one half of the persons killed in traffic accidents are drunk. Four, young people should know that the consumption of alcoholic beverages increases promiscuity, disease, divorce, vice, crime, poverty, and mortality from many diseases. Moreover, they should know why alcohol consumption does these things. That is, it does these things primarily 
because of its effect on the brain. Five, young people should know that the only cure for alcoholism and alcoholic addiction is total abstinence. Regarding abstinence, there is only one question to ask. What is the only what known, true, and scientific way never to become a drunken driver or a victim of acute and chronic alcoholism? Here we have an absolute and unchallengeable answer. Young people should know and can easily understand that abstinence is the only known, easy, and scientific way, the only way that works for everyone to prevent acute and chronic alcoholism, and abstinence is at present the only known way to cure alcohol addiction. I thank God that there are millions of fine young men and women like these who know how to think and act intelligently. We can be sure of our country's future when it rests in their hands. Remember, the choice is yours to drink or not to drink.